Next panel, now that we've gone to a global level, we're now going to hone in to kind of understand the regional level. So we're on the continent. There's a lot of different parts of the continent where entrepreneurship is thriving, where um, there are these hubs that everyone looks to as, um, as a success or at least an up and coming. So we'd like to welcome the next panel for, titled Regional Insights, Lessons from Across Africa. And we're really delighted to have people representing all the various aspects. We have people from West Africa, East Africa, South Africa. And so we hope that through this panel, you'll truly get a sense of what entrepreneurship is like um, from the 10,000 foot scale and narrowing it down um, to the continent. So I'd like to welcome Bintu Diallo to the stage, CJ Fonzi, Livingston Nkuzi, Asai Alile, and Yavi Madura, and the moderator, Aretha Wagosore, from the managing director of Inhomoko. Welcome to the stage. Good morning. Thank you, Gemi. Um, so our panel will discuss the intricacies of entrepreneurship in the African context, and we'll have rich contributions from our panelists coming from the different regions in Africa. Um, so we hear a lot that entrepreneurship is the backbone of Africa's economy, but really, how are we doing? You know, we're asking ourselves the right questions. What are the opportunities and challenges, and how do we ensure that entrepreneur, entrepreneurs are actually getting the right support, you know, in terms of business skills, um, vocational training, funding. Also, how do we create market linkages for businesses within, um, within the country and also beyond, you know, regionally? Um, do we include in ad advocacy to ensure that all African countries and governments are aligned with the mission of enabling small businesses to thrive and for communities to actually improve their livelihoods? Uh, moving from the aided Africa that we all know of to an innovative, dynamic, creative, and really transformed Africa. Um, so without further ado, uh, I'd like us to start with the questions. Um, I'd, I'd like to start with Bintu. <laughs> Bintu, let's talk about our youth. You know, Africa holds the largest youth population of any continent in the world, and by 2050, it's expected to double in population from 1 billion to 2.4 with more than half of those people being under, under the age of 25. Um, what mechanisms and strategies should we put in place to ensure that we have a growing working population? And what percentage do we expect entrepreneurship to cover? Thank you very much. Um, I would like to start with the context of West Africa, specifically in Francophone Africa, which is really crucial um, to start with. I remember in 2011, we were talking about that. And in 2017, Africa had 24% of entrepreneurs. And it's dropped because maybe of COVID or other difficulties uh, around. Uh, but specifically in West Africa, I don't know if you are aware that um, the region is under terrorism right now, a heavy terrorism. People might th many people are leaving, uh, big entrepreneurs, young entrepreneurs are now desperate, looking for jobs to sustain the living cost. And I believe through my um, incubator, that where that's now people should come and invest to avoid young people losing hope, starting to believe again that entrepreneurship is the way to go further. Um, so all those considerations you're talking about right now, if I have to face young people in my region, they will look at me like I'm an extraterrestrial talking about something that I, they don't understand. So the first strategy for me is to make sure we understand each other. We understand our context. We understand what it costs and what it means to have an integrated region. Because for, when I came here, people, I, I, I was joking with people yesterday, uh, please try to imagine where I'm coming from. I got called all the names except Burkina Faso. Why that? Because this is a part of Africa that has no clue 
about West Africa, specifically Francophone Africa. While each problem we're facing in West Africa right now is an entrepreneurial opportunity. That's where maybe I want us to focus on instead of figures in the future that doesn't mean to the people that should undertake entrepreneurship or work toward entrepreneurship. Yesterday, uh, the young people were taught having entrepreneurial mindset. Mm -hmm. My job daily, every Saturday, for the last 10 years, are dedicated to give young people entrepreneur mind, but specific to young girls, to deprogram young girls, to think differently, to think they're worthy, they have something to contribute. Specifically, they, they should commit to citizen and political engagement. And for that, on daily basis, what you face is young girl thinking it isn't worth it fighting anymore. We have to change that already for them to understand the global stake, the global understanding and what is elsewhere because they don't even have access to it most of the time. If they have access to it, they don't understand. They don't even know how they can contribute to shape and reshape. And they have an inner power that can make things different. When we talk about entrepreneurship in West Africa, guess uh, which country do you hear about? A quick guess? Nigeria. Nigeria. All West Africa today is Nigeria. Why we are 15 countries. So I'm calling up on my big brothers in Nigeria to start going elsewhere <laughs> within the region. Hope that clarifies a bit the setting. Thanks a lot, Bintu. Um, maybe you could hear from you, Osai. You're from Nigeria, right? <laughs> so. Oh my goodness. Um, I, I do understand what Bintu is saying, and we. But I think also it's from a place where, I mean, our population is very huge. Vast. Um, then, so when you see a number of people that are doing extremely well, it's so easy to say, okay, let's. Um, th these are Nigerians. Uh -huh. And then also, um, we are louder than most of the countries are. Uh, so, um, we, 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 you know, we, we, I mean, as entrepreneurs, we must realize that. Uh, and when we talk about the, the, when you are speaking about the issues that we're dealing with and the challenges and, and all those things, the numbers are, are there. But we have a long way to go in, in pushing, and, and that's across all African countries. And one of the major things that we have as a problem is also how um, the governance and all the issues and the policies are in, in place. So even when you mentioned that Nigerians are quite a number, we're, we're still very, very, the numbers, it's, it's huge for some countries. But for us, we're still fighting and, and complaining that we still have very low numbers uh, of entrepreneurs in the system that understand the process of actually being entrepreneurs. Um, so it's one thing to trade and one thing to, to do what you think, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm running a business, but it's another thing to do it that is viable and brings value to the country. And so uh, that's why I think the group before had mentioned about BDSs and all that, and we are trying to upscale and, and, all, and stuff like that. So it's, it's all, all necessary and all these things have to come in play together. Um, I mean, the, the statistics that just came out recently saying that 0.6% uh, 6, 0.6 out of one Nigerian is an entrepreneur. I mean, that's high. But how many of them are successful? That's a different ball game altogether. But the ones that are successful are loud about it. And they are also changing and pushing their brand out there. And that's why it's easy for them to get financing. So when we, when we spoke earlier and we're talking about all these things, everything comes into play in terms of who you are, your character as a person, what do you do, the soft skills are important. And going back to upskill yourself, relearning a lot of things. Uh, and I think the gentleman that was sitting here from the embassy, um, because you have to speak a certain language. And, and we know the countries we come from, we can't all speak that language. So we have to continuously 
learn and unlearn and teach them new skills. Um, so that's another thing we are also doing. So all the different uh, BDSs in Nigeria are realizing that there's so many things. When you go to a certain country, go to Canada, you speak a certain language. You go to, um, to, the, to, the, um, to the East, you, you speak a certain language. And you might complain, oh, why must I understand what they are doing? But they are the ones that give you the money. So you must know how to sit on the table with them and say, okay, this is how, um, I, I, I mean, it's almost like diplomacy. When you enter a room, I look at everybody around it. I mean, there's a way I, I have to relate to you for you to be able to sit down and continuously have a conversation with me. If not, after a while, you get tired and you're looking for somebody else to talk to. So we all have to teach. And, and we, I mean, when we're driving in today, we're talking about who are the examples out there? And are the examples actually speaking? Um, so if you have examples of good entrepreneurs, they are not actually telling you what challenges they've gone through to get to where they are today, and they're only telling us the, the nicest stories, then we have a problem. So who are we looking up to? As young people, who are, which, what are they looking up to? So we, we always have to, you know, I like the fact that they always throw Nigeria and just throw us somewhere, but, you know, we all, we all have a long way to go as a continent, as West Africa, and as countries as well. And every country is different. Even in Nigeria, every state is different. And we all rule differently. The way, we, the way I, as a BDS, works in Lagos is not the same way I work in the North. And I have to understand the communities I'm working with. So once you do that, then you begin to push yourself out there as well. But I mean, all power to Nigeria too. <laughs> Thank you so much, yeah. Asai. Um, I, I really like how you're saying it, you know, who are we looking up to? Who are we talking to? Who is talking to us? Who is talking to, to the youth? You know, who is actually telling them what to do or, you know, what not to do? So um, thank you so much. Uh, we can move on to our next question um, to be, you know, what, what focus should be, um, what focus should we have as, as Africans when we look at entrepreneurship? So we talk about food insecurity as a major challenge in Africa. And um, you know, knowing that agriculture contributes 23% of sub-Saharan Africa's GDP, and that small-scale holder farmers represent 60% of, of the Africa's economy. So how do we solve two problems at once? How do we make sure that the youth is actually embracing agriculture as a, as a business? Um, and you know, we, we cover that, that area, make sure that they're employed and that they're, we have a growing economy. And how do we also respond uh, to the food crisis that we have at the same time. Maybe we go with you, um, Yavi, first. We're starting with the ladies. I can see. <laughs> um, and it's, it's actually very nice uh, to be able to have so many women um, on panels. It's, it's, it's refreshing, so thank you. Um, agriculture is, is, you know, it's one of those things that we have not necessarily been able to harness. So the line goes that Africa has enough land to feed the world. However, we import most of our food and we pay in dollars and euros to do that. So that ability to be able to um, move across and create that bridge between us being able to harness what we have we have small scale farmers, we have, we have hands basically, we have hands and heads that are able to farm, we've got land to feed the world. So how do we then use technology? How do we then invest in our people in terms of skills development? How do we look at digital farming as a way of being able um, to fast track and leapfrog? The, the, the Ukraine, the Russian war on the Ukraine has presented the most amazing opportunity for Africa um, if we can get if we can get to it because that becomes the biggest problem. We love to talk and not necessarily act and implement. It's our biggest Achilles heel. Um, so 80% of the grain that is exported out of the Ukraine comes to Africa. So it's a simple thing. I, I had a meeting. Um, last week, Monday, with the ambassador of the Ukraine to South Southern Africa. And we had a discussion about how do we now start as Africa to partner 
with the Ukraine. They're under war, they're under siege, they can't even get their stuff past the Black Sea because the Russians are stopping it. So there is, to use um, the UN Secretary General's um, term, there will be a hunger hurricane in Africa if something is not done about that war and for that reason. So how do we now start to say to the likes of the Ukraine or any other um, supplier of our, of our basic food is how do we partner with you? How do we now start to work in a different environment? We can talk about this at length, but because I'm very passionate about it. However, I want to move quickly across to this phenomenon, and, and I'm a huge advocate of it. Um, I'm teased about it constantly. Um, but how do we now move and understand the gift that has been given to us in terms of the Africa continental free trade area. How do we take the opportunity from an agricultural perspective and say, with the Africa continental free trade area or the AFCFTA, and how do we start to move products and goods from an intra-Africa perspective so that we are not importing in, we are not sending money out, we are now creating wealth on the continent for our people, but we're also upscaling, upscaling, and creating global markets for products from Africa. These are the conversations that need to be held with our young people, with, um, with, with entrepreneurs, because therein lies, therein lies the opportunities. That's so true, um, Yavi. Yeah, I was just wanting to give an example of African Proof Foods. It's actually in the free zone. It's a company that produces super cereal f um, foods for WFP. And it feeds, you know, um, all the women, uh, all the preg uh, pregnant and lactating mothers in the refugee camps all over the world, actually. So this company started producing um, locally these super cereal um, foods. But when the Ukraine war hit, uh, they couldn't get enough maize and soya to continue production, you know. And so this is actually a real case scenario that we have right here in the free zone where production stopped for over a week because of the Ukraine. So we had to look, you know, I, I was working with a company at that time, so that's why I know the details, but like we had to actually go look for maize in the region because we can't, we don't have enough maize production to be able to, 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 uh, to get enough produce. Mm. So it's, it's actually just a real life example. Um, yeah, please go ahead. Can I, can I just say very quickly, um, so it's, it's, uh, we've we've started. So I've got you know there's Pabwa, uh, the Pan African Business Women's Association, and then there's a recently launched um, African Prosperity Fund that we launched in September, and the board member of that comp a board member of that company was sitting next to me on the plane, <laughs> so we had this this huge conversation and actually going to be able to now start creating some of those programs and some of those initiatives that I was saying to you earlier and conversations out of with the ambassador to the uh, ambassador of the Ukraine to South Africa um, and being able to now connect because obviously there is value in things like you have reduced stunting and all of those kind of things that he, he kept me enamored for five hours on the plane telling me about all these things. So. Yes, great things to come. Such a small world. Um, so do we do hear from you, Livingston, on the scene? Yeah, I, I think mine is more on the perspective on how actually we can make agriculture even much more attractive to young people. Because I think this is the young energy we need in the f sector. Uh, when you see um, the people who are practicing agriculture today, our parents, our grandparents, and so on, I think they are not up to the challenge of today. So what we're doing is the way we can redesign the thinking around the sector and ensure that actually agriculture is becoming more attractive to the new energy that we need. Uh, what we learned in the uh, pandemic is, is that you could have whatever it takes, but you couldn't live without food. You, you could even have the best insurance, but you could die. And the health sector could even be much more active and well-structured, and you could still die. But one reason why people stayed even longer is the food, because they needed to eat, they needed to survive, because everything was cut off. When you stay in homes for weeks, months, and so on, you needed food. So this is the new trend. And I think 
uh, the best way or the faster we can do to redesign the sector and also attract funding to the sector is the best way we can actually uh, address issues that are happening. If you can structure partnership with Ukraine, but once you have not invested into the sector, you you not produce anything. We need to restructure funding into the sector. And uh, that's why maybe uh, to reflect back at the work we're doing at the foundation, MasterCard Foundation, is now we made we have made agri agriculture be a priority sector across all our interventions because we need to see enough investments. We need to de-risk the sector so that we, uh, even the financial institutions can gain that confidence uh, and start investing into the sector. So perspectively, that's how I think that's the trend we should take and have uh, these conversations be shifted into real implementation on how, who is supposed to be in the sector how can we help to grow the sector? And what has been the learnings from the old way of practicing agriculture to current way of what is needed uh, to be done? Thank you. Thanks a lot, Livingston. I like how the focus for MasterCard is really agriculture and tourism and hospitality, and which is really two things that at least we could use in Rwanda for the time being. Um, so moving on to Fonzi, uh, by 2019, more than 400 tech hubs have opened across Africa. You know, Lagos, Nairobi, Cape Town lead the continent in the tech revolution with thousands of startups having emerged in these cities, along with co-working spaces. Uh, I think the group be before us talked about it, technology parks, incubators, accelerators, and innovation hubs. But Africa potential for entrepreneurship bodes well for its economic growth challenges in cultivating innovation still persists though. What do you think are the main challenges? What would you say are the main challenges for us to really embrace innovation, digitization? It's an interesting question and it's one we've been talking about for decades, right? And I think as I was reflecting this morning, I've, I've worked with many people in this room, <laughs> CMU, MasterCard, um, uh, RDB, uh, mini ICT, the US government, the World Bank, et cetera, to, to try to answer that question, right? And it's, we, we, we study it from one angle, we study it from another angle, we study it from another angle. And we know one thing. We know that we don't employ Africa without innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, we're learning about what works. I don't think anyone knows yet what works. Um, but I think one of the crucial learnings we've had over the last few years is that entrepreneurs aren't a monolithic animal, right? Um, they're, they're different and they have different objectives and different mindsets, right? And, and we can begin to break them down and say, okay, well, we've got our, our small businesses, right? The, the people that might have um, gone out there, maybe we call them necessity entrepreneurs. Maybe they're more than that. Maybe they're, they're very driven by what they do and, and, and they're excited about it um, on the one end, right? And then on the far other end, right, we've got our, our hockey stick growth innovation businesses. Um, and there's an interrelation between them, but they need very different things to succeed. Um, I think it was just last week in Kenya, um, President Ruto um, made, made good on the first part of his promise around the Hustlers Fund, right, which is to make some, some capital available for these people that are out there spotting opportunity gaps, trying to fill them. We, we know in, in, in most economies across Africa, that's actually the majority of the jobs are people in these, these small businesses, one to five staff. The businesses aren't well suited to grow, um, but they are employing a lot of people. And, and for many, that's how you pay school fees and that's how you get your children and the next generation onto a path to, to a job that with maybe more growth potential. Um, all the way on the other side, right, we, we look at um, Norskin House coming in to, to Kigali um, we go walk around these innovation hubs in, in Nigeria, South Africa, Kenya, elsewhere, and we see, we see a bustle and an energy, right? Um, now, those two types of entrepreneurs need very different things, right? And I think too often we still conflate them, right? And we take a CMU Africa graduate with tech skills and business and, and, and some funds that they're able to access, and we put them through the same marketing course we put a, a small business owner through, right? Or, or we take that small business owner and we sit them down and talk about all the jobs they're gonna create, right? And it's, it's not fit for purpose, right? So crucially, I think we need to begin to segment that market and, and, and understand 
who we're serving, understand what people need, understand how to do that. Um, I think we're in an interesting time right now, right? I heard a lot of doom and gloom amidst some op optimism on this panel so far with security challenges here, um, some, some sort of systems that we hope would start faster that aren't starting there. We haven't even mentioned, um, you know, countries that are looking at 20 plus percent inflation and cost of capital just going up. There, there's some challenge, but there's, I think there's a lot of reason to be optimistic, right? Um, as we're seeing, um, so one, one of the things that I'm, I'm beginning to actually step away from my consulting portfolio, we just raised money for a venture studio in climate, um, and we're, we're going to be working with a handful of invest, um, entrepreneurs over the next five years to, to build climate unicorns, right? Um, there's, there's 120 trillion that's going to flow into that space in the next few years, right? Africa's seeing almost none of that investment, but it all wants to come to Africa, right? Um, how do we roll up our sleeves? How do we really get in there and build the businesses that can do that? I think that's crucial. And I think um, I'm, I'm, I was really struck on the last panel, Steve said, what does it take to walk into a bank and find somebody with some skills, maybe a little bit of, of financial security, um, a, a career where they can look back and see a potential opportunity gap? How do we help that person feel comfortable stepping out of the bank and stepping into entrepreneurship? What does it look like to invest in that person? What does it look like to hold their hand, right, and help them build an exciting, innovative business? And by the way, when we build those hockey stick businesses that employ hundreds, thousands of people, all of those people then become the clients of those SMEs, of those hustlers' businesses, right? And that's how I think we spin up um, our, our economies. So anyways, uh, the, the key point I would make is let's figure out how we find the right people. Let's figure out how we support them with the right thing. Let's figure out how we, we nudge them into the right markets. And let's really stop talking about entrepreneurs and start talking about people based on where their opportunities are and their needs are. Thank you so much, Fonzi. I really like that uh, approach. Um, currently, uh, in your regions, would you, how would you describe, um, you know, maybe we'll start with West Africa. <laughs> how would you describe a great enabling environment for entrepreneurs to actually grow? You can talk about the legal or regulatory framework, you know, what's working besides the war, besides the troubles that we have in, in Africa, in West Africa. I think in West Africa, what is really working, especially, uh, young people and women, it's the level of resilience and creativity. How do they turn um, what it seemed to be disaster to opportunity? We're seeing a lot of young people coming up with brilliant ideas about innovating agriculture, solution, learning what soil is good for what crop, and those type of uh, initiatives need to be encouraged. And maybe stop putting small money in it and being courageous to invest enough to, to create a real value chain, transforming each area of agriculture or of the tech to an, entrepre to, to an entrepreneurship opportunity for someone to be able to fill the gaps all over the place. Because what some entrepreneur, young entrepreneurs are facing uh, in West Africa they come up with big ideas, big solutions. They get known. They, they have access to information, communication. They, are, they get exposed. And quickly, they lack product to sell. Many of them are facing like that. So for me, it's, it's a challenge and an opportunity to invest in, to encourage them. And even today, we have a lot of internal, intern uh, displays uh, people, IDPs, uh, in all over West Africa. Those people are coming from an agricultural background. They have indigenous knowledge. How do we take that to incorporate, incorporate it to technology, to scale it up to a different level, while giving them the right tools and the right skills to scale up and to be independent and create a chain of opportunity uh, around the, the region. So, as I said, 
everything might be terrorism, hunger, name it, conflict. But in every problem lies a huge opportunity of entrepreneurship to bring a huge solution for a better place. And I do believe this is the moment to come to West Africa, no matter what. And this is the moment to invest so young people will stop being enrolled with terrorists. And it might be silly of my part, too much hopeful, but this is what I believe. In every problem lies an opportunity. And uh, I always tell myself and young people that the good part of entrepreneurs is not your brain, it's your heart. Because that's where you turn evil to good or good to evil. Thank you so much, Bintu. Um, I completely agree with you. Uh, one thing that, um, that we are doing currently in Rwanda, actually, uh, through Ingomoko, is we are enabling these internally displaced people and the refugees. We work, we work a lot with refugees. Um, so we're in the five camps in, uh, in Rwanda. And we're also in Kenya and Ethiopia doing the same thing. But what we, we've actually noticed is, you know, most of these people are either uh, farm, farmers or, in, you know, into agribusiness before they actually come into the camps or before they are displaced. So what we've done is we've, you know, worked with uh, UNHCR and MINEMA to actually find ways of, you know, giving, giving them land to be able to continue the farming. Because we, we, yes, go ahead, please. Yeah, and one thing, most of the time we think that policies are important to make things happen. I do believe solidarity in entrepreneurship and making things happen will oblige the state to make policies that go with it. Absolutely, absolutely, that's a great comment. Um, so we create the opportunities first and we want the policies to follow to make sure that you know everything is regulated in the right way. Totally agree with you. Um, maybe moving on to Yavi. Um, so can you, tell, can you tell, tell us a little bit more about the One Billion Africa Prosperity Fund? <laughs> how was it established? Is it sector agnostic? And you know, how does it work? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, so, <laughs> We, there was no, there was no plan. There was no, I'm, I'm a, I'm a former uh, corporate investment banker in my, you know, before my serial entrepreneur days. Um, but there was never a plan to set up a fund. I, it, it was never the plan. The plan came about because of the fact, it's what Livingston alluded to. We, we need to be able to look at our problems as Africans, and we need to invest in the solutions ourselves. We need to, you know, it is fortuitous um, that I am ending, this is my last trip for the year. I'm, I'm one of those people that live in, live in planes and hotels, and I hate it, but it is fortuitous that I'm in the land of the man who gave us three words that has driven my narrative specifically this year, but has given us three words that define hope. Um, I'm an unapologetic fan of your president, but it is trade, not aid. And when we start to see Africa in a very particular way, and we understand its potential, and we understand what can be done with it, it is by no means, um, we need to invest in it ourselves before we go and ask anyone else for FDIs and all of those kind of things. We need to invest in it ourselves. The African Prosperity Fund, it's a billion dollar uh, impact fund uh, for the next five years. It was launched by President Nana Kufo Addo in, in Ghana in, in September. And it seeks to be able to look at specific um, areas of for economic development and growth, but specifically um, infrastructure development, technological advancement and digitalization, um, uh, women and youth inclusion. We call it the why factor because you always start with why. Um, and specifically looking at it from an agricultural perspective and uh, from, a, from a climate change agenda. One of the biggest issues, and I'm gonna go back to, to Bintu's comment about policy, 
We have the most amazing policies in Africa. Have you noticed that? Every government has the most amazing policies. We don't do anything with these policies. So I'm going to give you one example um, to illustrate my point. And because I'm, I'm pan-African, um, I look at it from a pan-Africanist perspective. So, and I'm a consultant to the African Union. So um, there's this thing called the Free Movement Protocol. It was basically came into being three, four months before the AFCFTA. AFCFTA has been signed, ratified, done. It's been implemented. We're moving forward. The free movement protocol has not been signed by the required number of countries, my country included. Um, it, yet we want the AFCFTA to be a success. The free movement protocol, first of all, it is, it's just my opinion, my humble opinion. I don't know why it's got the word free in it, because that's what confuses everyone. It, it is not free movement. You still have to arrive and like kind of get a visa on arrival or whatever the case is. And by the way, landing in Rwanda, South Africa could really take a couple of lessons, very big lessons, because your visa took all of you know two seconds. Um, there was no issue. And these, so this is what we are aiming for, the African Union passport um, or the African passport and that movement to be able to drive entrepreneurship. Can you imagine a day where we have a visa in inverted commas for entrepreneurs that are able to move across the continent freely. That, that, and that is the dream um, of an example. That is the dream of the African Prosperity Fund. So our, our goal is to create, in the end, is to create African billionaires and more listed African companies that are homegrown and driven through the African agenda by Africans for Africans. I think we should clap more for this. Uh, and this is for five years, right? Um, yeah, so we were given the target by the champions, and the champions are President Nana and, and uh, my president, Saro Ramaphosa. So I, it's, 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 it's hugely challenging. I'll just, I'll just give you one challenge that we're dealing with at the moment. We, I mean, we're, we're bankers, we're you know, financial services people, and even we didn't anticipate. So one of our biggest challenges at the moment is that in order to distribute funds, um, because we just thought we're going to go, we got our, you know, we, we just, we thought it's going to be a very, very easy process. Well, easy, but, but, you know, difficult at the same time in terms of getting 55 countries um, from a distribution perspective. Our biggest, going back to the policy issue, our biggest challenge at the moment is that some countries, the ones who need it the most, don't have fiscal policies, regulatory, and, and we cannot distribute funds where there is no. So if it means that, and this is what we're doing now, we're taking five steps back and saying to countries, OK, let us help you set up your fiscal policy. Let us help you set up your regulatory environment if that is what it's going to take in order for us to get money through it, to invest in that particular, you know, whatever it may mean. So yeah, it's, it's, it's quite a, so when we say five years, I, I don't know how long that's going to take, but we just need to focus on how do we get done what we need to do and invest in ourselves. That's the goal. So to the person that's here, probably in the room, and he's an entrepreneur, and, he, and he's ready, and he has a very good project that he, you, you know, that he needs investment for, um, is Rwanda ready as a country? In terms of policies, in terms of you know, all the paperwork that you would require? So Rwanda is ready. Um, there are obviously various countries across the continent that are ready. But w we cannot not, because we will then drive, think about it from our perspective, we will then drive a situation where the rich get richer and the poor are going to get poorer. Because if we start going into implementation mode of project and investment funding, um, we're going to focus on the projects and investments. And then the people that don't have the policies and whatever else, and the, the, the whole thing about prosperity is that Africans, what is in our ground, I've got a thing about, I'm a, I'm a gender activist, so I, I say, mother the sisterhood long, began long before any of us created sisterhoods. Um, mother Nature 
blessed Mother Africa with riches beyond our wildest imagination. It is now time for us to be able to take what, is, what have we been blessed with and really make it work for us, specifically for the next generation, because I'm embarrassed as this generation to hand over a continent that is deeply corrupt, highly in debt, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we need to take our natural resources, and that means that we've got to invest in the right things. So yes, to answer your question, yes, a Rwanda would be ready, but if we look at it from an African prosperity perspective, we've got to get everyone into a certain space before we say, okay, right, let's do this. You know, it's, it's a difficult one. <laughs> Thank you so much, Yavi. Um, moving on to you, Osali. Um, so how should the African ecosystem come together? We have many forums, um, you know, within the year on entrepreneurship. We have the GW that just ended in November, you know, what other platforms do you think we should be part of to make sure that we have this connection, you know, which is our theme today, connecting Africa's entrepreneurship ecosystem, you know, how do we, how do we bring ourselves together for the same goal, you know, being the West, the South, the North is not represented today, but like, you know, the East, everybody else. Um, thank you. Um, I think, yeah, yeah, yeah I mean, we, we tend to do a lot of work in silos, and um, one of, that's one of the challenges we face as Africans. Um, we find out that we have strong projects, but um, you're just doing it. Nobody else knows that. Uh, even in, in a certain country, you find out that there are so many of them, and everyone is doing their own little thing. Um, and we just have to find a way of bringing it together. So a few people in some countries have started, um, I mean, we're here now, and there are quite a number of us from different sectors coming in. And I mean, even just having a conversation with the other two ladies today, there's so much that we can learn from each other. Um, so we have to open our minds that first uh, and open our minds to think that it's just not only about me being in Nigeria, it's also what's happening in West Africa, what's happening across Africa. Uh, and really, it's about information as well. Uh, because what we don't know, what you don't know, can kill you. <laughs> so it's really about asking and, and finding out. And then even f for every one of us here, if you're doing a pro project or you're doing a program, um, and that's why you can go online. Every, there's so much information. Um, don't um, leave it to just a few of, oh, I'm just going to invite people I know. Um, and we have to all get out of our comfort zones. And that's what we're teaching the entrepreneurs. And so we ourselves have to do exactly what we're teaching. Um, come out of your comfort zones. Look for who else is out there. What are they doing? And even for those that have failed, why did they fail? I mean, someone has to tell you that I've had a business for 15 years as a BDS, or I've been running this for 15 years, and all of a sudden you find out that they've kind of just disappeared. What went wrong? What can we learn from them? And use all those learning tactics so that we don't make the same mistakes as well. But we go back into governance and leadership, and, and that's where one of the main problem is. Um, you find out that where all the different countries, um, the presidents are just doing their own thing and you know enjoying the, the enjoyment of life and, and stuff like that. Um, um, but we, we, they must, as, uh, as African leaders, come together and, and um, we have to just go back to how things were done before. Um, in terms of, if you're, in, uh, you're talking about African Union, but nobody really goes to the meetings, nothing comes out of it anymore. Uh, so when we, that, and that's really high level. Uh, so once we are all thinking about that, that's when the trade, a trade goes better and um, traveling. I mean, why do I, it took me almost how many months to get a visa to go to South Africa? And then I, I pull my passport out, I put it back in again, and I get a visa, it's two months, a two months visa. And I've been going to South Africa for 20 years. So it doesn't make any sense. It makes no sense at all. And we're supposed to be, you know, brother and sister. We're <laughs> but it's, it's just ridiculous. And it's the same thing in Nigeria as well. So once we begin to all work together, then we begin to solve those problems together. Then it's the same thing when you're coming to all the BDSs and entrepreneurs. Why should an entrepreneur, even in Nigeria, that is doing almost the same solution as someone is doing in Rwanda? And you cannot even communicate and say, okay, what are the challenges they face? What can we do different? And I know some BDSs do it. And then they kind of make sure that everyone is, I mean, they can learn from someone in Burkina Faso, you can learn from someone in Ghana and all that. But we must do it in a more deliberate fashion and not wait for it to just happen by mistake. Because we learn from each other. You cannot run in isolation. And that's the problem we have as Africans. Um, yes, we are all very, very different in different ways, but we are all very the same. And then also how we speak about the country and the continent too. You, uh, and I like what she said. You can't as Africans, and then you sit down quietly and you want to just bash and bash and bash and bash and bash. And you all, the, everything you're talking about is very negative. There are challenges. 
we, we must be able to step mark those kind of challenges, but also talk about the numbers that we are doing, we are, and we are doing well to a certain extent. To, I mean, when I started this work 20, 20 something years ago, and now the entrepreneurs I've seen now, I'm completely phenomenal. I can mention the number of entrepreneurs we have, at least in Nigeria, and, and in, in a lot of countries in, in West Africa, they are doing exceptional work. And the amount of money that they are raising, just sitting in Lagos or sitting in Kaduna, and, uh, and they're, they're not even moving out of the country. So we do have good um, uh, examples. So we have to be able to showcase those examples. And I think I'm going back to what I said at the beginning. How are we telling our stories different as well? How are we branding ourselves as human beings? And, and first of all, as human beings, and then as Africans, before you even talk about the country. And then when you do that, who doesn't want to sit at a table with people that are telling them? I mean, when people are talking about Rwanda, everything here is all nice. It's because people are telling me a good story too as well now. So, and look, she even wants to move to Rwanda now. <laughs> You're telling a good story. So we all have to tell the story well. Um, that doesn't mean that we have to hide the fact that we have challenges because it's not going to go away, but we have to all speak truth about what we're doing and do it well together, 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 together. And hopefully when that happens, then we begin to build and move. And then we can push our entrepreneurs forward. They are doing amazing work. I've met quite a few of them from Rwanda as well, and I know how much it takes for anyone to get to a place where you can get that kind of funding from anywhere in the world, I mean, and you're sitting down in a country, and some of them have never been out of the country before in their lives. So we, we are doing something right, and then we just have to know how to push it out there. Wow, so passionate. <laughs> I like that. Um, so definitely telling our story works. And I think we need to be very intentional, you know, how we tell our story, but also how we learn from each other, how we want to probably, you know, us as a BDS to actually come to you, to Nigeria, really learn from experiences, learn from other countries, and also governance, definitely. You know, our countries need to start really doing some good work. So moving on to you, Livingston. Um, MCF, MasterCard Foundation, has played a big role we must actually clap for them. Um, it's not only in Rwanda, it's a little bit everywhere. Anybody who's in entrepreneurship knows MasterCard Foundation. You know, and you have become an enabler for entrepreneurship through your strategy of creating 30 million jobs in Africa by 2030. What are the wins and learnings so far and what are the impact targets being met? Oh, sorry, how? <laughs> you don't have to talk about the numbers. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you so much. Uh, we set a target, of course, to at least to put uh, 30 million young people into employment by 2030. And uh, the journey started, uh, I think, by 2018 and so on. But throughout this journey, of course, also COVID came in. And uh, we had to reflect and uh, take a step back. Who are these young people? Are they even going to survive the pandemic? So we're like, okay, now we had to think about saving lives and livelihoods. So we had to direct our thinking and say, okay, how do we make even the businesses that are going to give employment survive? Because we want young people to be in employment, but who are the people going to employ them? We want young people to actually start businesses but are they really going to start businesses? Because the situation was not uh, all that uh, favoring them. The pandemic was hitting when lockdowns and so on. So we invested our resources into uh, the COVID resilience and recovery programs. Of course, we had to invest in health to ensure that these young people and the people themselves of Africa and across the world do survive the pandemic. Uh, we learned lessons. You could find that, of course, businesses, young entrepreneurs are struggling actually to even exist. So we had to see, uh, create packages for them to, uh, to sustain their businesses first, but also sustain those jobs they had at, the, at that particular moment. So that was the step back we took. And uh, believe me, we have also learned a lot of lessons from that. Uh, ensuring that this business survive and also recover from the pandemic and they keep the jobs they had without even hiring more. That was a very good uh, uh, step we took. But also throughout the pandemic, we were not like only assisting businesses. 
and uh, ensuring that they survive. We were rethinking our strategies on how to hit the 30 million jobs. So throughout this, we decided to identify key pillars and key sectors. Uh, that's the agriculture sector, towards and hospitality, digital economy, and uh, also the creatives. Uh, my colleagues in Nigeria, I think we're focusing more on the creatives. I think the creative industry is doing great in Nigeria, and we are seeing many young people actually uh, going into that. So, but we could, as the foundation, put resources in this. We could, like, enable finance, enable markets, and BDS. But what were the system level uh, 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 issues young people were facing? The policies they are uh, praying in, are they favoring? Are they part of structuring such uh, policies? So we're looking at different ways, even to change mindset. You want, you are deploying, you can enable access to finance, you can put resources in the banks, but will they go even walk into the banks and get access to such resources? Even if you say, okay, I'm going to give you a loan at zero interest. How is the market praying? Because we're focusing on young people, and particularly young women. Today, if a young woman can access finance, if he's ma uh, that young woman is uh, married, how will the partner, the husband, also perceive it? So we have to pray, we have to reflect and see, you know, answering into uh, problems that are visible, but also there are those that are invisible. The norms, the cultural settings, are they really supporting? Is the ecosystem supporting uh, the young people to be entrepreneurs? Are they having a seat on the decision-making table? You know, uh, recently, when we were in Chogam, I think young people kept on saying that there is nothing for us without us. So are we just making them beneficiaries? Or they are part of the solution? And the, that's why at the foundation currently, uh, we are partnering with institutions that are embracing that. If you're going to come to the foundations and you, uh, you have a solution for young people, and they are not part of that solution, I will not talk much with you. Because we want them to be implementing partners. We want them to actually be the one Offering the jobs to young, fairly young people. Because if you're going to support MSMEs, you're going to say, these are young people's businesses. I know MSME can create employment, but also studies so that if young people are the one owning those businesses, they will definitely employ young people. If women are the one owning those businesses, we'll definitely employ women. So uh, those are kind of system level uh, issues we are trying to address. And uh, of course, currently, we, out of the 30 million, we have reached around 4.5. And we're remaining almost, if we are, by next year, we, remain, we will be remaining with seven years to go. So we're looking forward for <laughs> partners that are, well, are really embracing our principles of engaging young people to come and work with us and see that actually we create those young people's opportunities, we create those jobs. And it's a journey to take, but also there are many learnings we are picking from that and we are embracing the learnings as we go on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Livingston. Um, I'd like to open it up to, the, to, the, to you. Any questions? Yes, please. Um, yeah, I'll bring the microphone. Thank you very much. I'm Sunday Adebisi from Lagos, Nigeria. So I, I think this is the best um, I've listened to since I've been here because um, it connects with so many things we've been saying since yesterday. And I want to thank uh, Yavi uh, for some of those things that you mentioned. And um, Osai, that was very great. Um, I want to spill two beans here so that um, uh, I use my academic lens to look at things and um, I've been researching in entrepreneurship for about 20 years and um, we have a lot of data, we have a lot of things and we are happy at what Africa has been able to achieve. The number one thing, I'll reverse it, 
is to take it from um, the experience of Osai and what Yavi had said. I'm here too because I deliberately um, protested against South Africa. I was to be in Cape Town. They'll be sending the picture to me. Uh, I was to take some of my early career postdoctoral students to South Africa. They took away my own passport, gave me visa, and left the three people. And I decided not to go. And I wrote that I wasn't, you know, good enough. So after he's here, we should save, you know, Africa. It, we, we know what it took us to get to where we had, we, where we had today. And in November, when country were to sign, some will sign and say, I'm not signing, I won't sign the free, you know, uh, the, I mean, free movement, but I can sign this economic part. And I asked myself a question as a professor of entrepreneurship that are we serious at all? Will it not have been better to take away that free, you know, from heat, or we do not even do this at all? So, my first contribution is that, thank you, CMU, we should take something like this to the next AU meetings. You are speaking to the converted. I'm already converted. Many people here are converted. You guys are converted. But if 54 African leaders don't even know what we're saying, they don't understand it. So, um, you're doing so much um, a MasterCard, but the policies are going to be, you know, driven by these guys that sit in national assemblies. The younger ones were encouraging the policies coming out frustrating them. So the question is that we will keep on doing this. If we do not take this kind of gathering, we won't, we'll tell them not to sponsor it. MasterCard, look at it. When is the next AU meeting? Get some of us, you know, guys like this, get all of us to say, please give us a session. You're not sponsoring it. We just want you to listen to us. Give us four hours. We want you to listen to us. Just sit down. All the things you need, we will provide. But listen to us. I can imagine if my president is seated in this place and the president of South Africa, and I'm saying what I'm saying, that I, a professor of entrepreneurship, say I'm not coming to South Africa again because of this. Maybe you would think that's okay. Oh, what is happening here? We need to reverse. It is very important. So I think the next thing we need to do is to speak to them and how we can all, you know, talk to ourselves, how we can speak to these people, get them into the room for them to hear us and to know that some of us are very bitter because we're doing a lot, but because of their policies, these things are not what, they're not coming out fine. That's my first contribution. So my question to you now is the, I will be hypothetical, it's one of the things we're suffering now. I have 62,000 students um, in University of Lagos. Um, I was, uh, I think my university uh, was the first person, first university to set up incubation hub, active incubation hub in the university system so that we can begin to get a student to, know, to do all of this and to create businesses. Now, I came with five brilliant students into this place. Three of them have been trying to counsel them how not to jackpa, how not to go away because look, these are people that I know that their businesses can become another Google and Facebook. But now, that is the greatest challenge. I've been able to train about 10,000 in five years. Now I can't even trace about half of them are in Canada, US. These were guys that had fantastic business ideas. They were sat down together and I counseled. And we're working on it that before I could say Jack Robinson, they've left. Now the question is this. Is this another um, digital slave trade? That's my big question. I guess so many of my students who are already, you know, doing things in the digital space and they are trying to create businesses, and from nowhere, they'll, they'll come to my office and say, sir, please, I've just gotten this um, remote work. It will pay me $4,000 in a month. Uh, you know what we've been working on? We've just pretended it. I we're still going to do, I think the $4,000 may be better. From doing remote work, you know, the offshore, the next time, you know, is calling me from um, America and say, I'm now here. So my question is this, now that Africa has gotten to the point of success, getting, you know, uh, a young one to digitize their mind in entrepreneurship, and we're losing them, then what happens in the next three, four years? How do we solve this? And this is a very big question on top of my head, and I want you guys to address it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, who wants to go first? Okay, I'll go, I'll go. Um, it is, it is very important for us to be able to merge uh, sectors. So public sector, private sector, civil society needs to come together. So exactly what you are saying. 
the, the thing about this is, is that we will leave here today and we won't do it. And that becomes our thing. And therefore, we need to create that intention. Um, I just want to point out a couple of things um, that you may or may not know about. When it comes, so because I've chaired the, um, the free movement protocol sensitization across the continent, um, I'm, 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 I'm tasked with uh, delivering uh, of the report. And it is very interesting to be able to see, um, because I, we've done it in, the, in all five regions, and it's very interesting to see the dynamic when you're in different regions, how each of the regions respond to FMP. But the one thing that I can say to you, and, and I'm in, technically I'm an AFCFTA um, specialist, expert, whatever you want to call it, one of the things that I didn't anticipate before we went into the sessions that has now come out very, very strongly is that it's going to be the AFCFTA that actually forces the FMP. We didn't think that that, no one ever considered that. We thought, how would the AFCFTA be a success without the FMP? But when you see what people are doing and how they are moving across the continent, because here's the issue, movement is happening, legal or otherwise, whether we like it or not. So you may get stopped at the South African border, but somebody's jumping over a fence. <laughs> So at the end of the day, movement is happening, and it's going to force it. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, is and the UK is a, is a great case study for me in terms of, because I'm a techie, um, in terms of digital transformation, that's my day job. <laughs> um, and when we looked at why we are losing, um, technically we're having a technological brain drain in terms of the youth, um, they do two things, and I'm, they do a lot of things, but I'm just going to talk about two things to, to keep this short. The first is they have a thing called the Tech Nation uh, Visa. I don't know if you know about it. The Tech Nation Visa is extremely elite. Like, the tech companies in, in, in the UK would give their arm and leg to have a person qualify under the Tech Nation Visa. And where are they getting most of their visa um, people from, shall we say, or applicants, is Africa. So they make it elite, they position it, they create an entire thing. We kind of look at our young people and we're like, oh. The average age of Africa is 19.7. That's not you and I. We're a, literally a dying breed. Um, secondly, sorry, secondly, the thing about um, the investment into the tech hubs by the UK into, I'm just giving you one example, obviously there's, there's other countries doing it, is that they then create startups and then invite those startups to be able to have tax holidays if they move their head offices to the UK, et cetera, et cetera. Rwanda is the only country, and I'm not just saying it because I'm here, it's actually on, it's in my narrative all the time. Rwanda is the only country that looks at the startup culture. They give tax holidays to their startup. They invest like venture capitalists into their startups and create specific skills in terms of programmers, et cetera, et cetera. And until we get that across the continent and across into the African Union's frame of reference and mind, and there are very few voices, and I sometimes call myself the lone voice of reason, um, we are not going to get to be able to move forward. So just in terms of those kind of things, please, let's make sure that by the time we leave this room today, we have created some kind of group committee, whatever you want to call it, that says we're going to sit down with the African Union and we're going to say a couple of things to them and we're going to ask them for a few outcomes. Until we actually do it, we can't have an expectation of them. So that's it from my side. <laughs> uh, yes. I just I, have I, a minute. <laughs> okay. I, I just want to pick up on the students that left for high-paying jobs and ask the question of, is, is it a travesty or do we celebrate it? And I think we don't know the answer yet because I think it, it depends on whether they went 
to North America, earned some prove it money, built a lot of skills, and came back to the continent, or whether they got excited about their 401ks and built their families and applied for citizenship and, and never came back, right? Um, and so I think a crucial thing for us thinking about our, our ecosystems to think about is with those students, how do we bring them back, right? Because it, it is true, it is an unfortunate truth that if we look at per capita GDPs across the continent and we look at historical wealth across the continent, there is not the same kind of prove it money in Africa that others have, right? Um, you've got situations where people don't have family wealth to try to start a business. You've got situations where people have big families to take care of, school fees to pay for younger siblings, for, for, for their broader family. And so to continue to look at our ecosystem here and say, it should work the same as it does in Europe, right? But invest your first $100,000 of your own money and then an investor will back you. Okay, well then we're gonna need a lot of Nigerians to go take jobs in the US for a while, make some money and come back if we're gonna grow that way. And we've just kicked the can down the road on a truly vibrant innovation ecosystem and our share of unicorns on the continent by, by generations, right? Um, so I think what we need to be thinking about is how do we build the business models? How do we build the entrepreneurship support organizations to synthetically create that, right? And you have you talked about some of what we're doing in, in Rwanda, and I'm excited about some of it at, at, at a public sector basis. But there's only so much the public sector will be able to do, right? How do we create, you know, I, I'm very excited about these venture studio models, ironically coming from the US and the west coast of the US, right? But they're saying, well, why don't we create a bunch of smart people, create a pot of money, be able to actually pay that Nigerian student who would have had to go elsewhere for a job to build his business? We'll take some equity in that. Right? And that's how we justify paying for it. And by the way, we can bring in some networks and connections to investors and ability to work across markets and maybe the clout to go to the AU with some of these things. Right? And so I, I think we need to be thinking, if we don't innovate, all we can do is hope those guys come home. And we should bring them home. But we should also be thinking about how do we innovate so that the next set has that opportunity here. And those structures are known. We see them. Let's build them. Let's capitalize them. Let's, let's try to make them work. Thank you so much, Siji. Um, please, yes, go ahead. Yeah, um, that, that is a very interesting question. And I will gonna uh, build on what they, they just said and just talk about what uh, one pleasant surprise that we had this year in West Africa with regard to World Cup, the license to, to broadcast the World Cup. For the last 50 or 55 years, only Canal Plus had the license to broadcast the World Cup uh, in West Africa, mainly in Francophone countries. For the first time in the history, uh, a company built by the diaspora within the technology, the New World TV, got the license to broadcast the, the World Cup in, on the continent. So those are also opportunity to enable their return, they, most of the diaspora people, they want to come back home, but most of the time the environment is not an enabling environment to, to make that happen. What Togo has done is something to build on uh, in West Africa, in Nigeria, Ghana, and, and so on. So for me, we have to tap into and also have the right people in the room. For me, the next step will be with CMU to bring some of them here. Because sometimes when you go where people are comfortable in their arena, you may be alone in the room. And you'll be speaking like my sister here, and they'll be saying, yeah, well done. Uh, we encourage you. And they leave, and they continue to do what they, they're doing. And they will talk about her like one single uh, crazy lady that's, that is making noise in their, in their ears all the time. So also, how do we empower more people like her to be uh, kind of have, having many people like her in the room so they can't in, ignore the voices? And making sure when they take the decision, how do we take it to the people to create um, accountability 
with the civil society, private sector, and encourage our private sector to invest in younger people in sort of MasterCard is good, any other solution outside is good, but how do our philanthropists, Tony Elumino, Dangote, uh, Chris Bank in Burkina Faso, uh, I, I, I'm sure many others, how do we encourage them to build on young people you are training from the beginning to, to, to the startup point, building new skills and allowing them to go out, bring some more skills, and, and have people like uh, the new world TV in, in Togo. I know time is Baby is looking at me, <laughs> but yeah. Uh, maybe you give us a second? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. I know time is not on our side, but let me make one point. I, I mean, most of the intubation or tech hubs and so on, uh, they are powered by Google app and other uh, big techs. And you expect them not to <laughs> poach and take the resources. So I think we need to power those tech hubs by our own selves. So if we go into actually to maintain the resources in Africa, because these guys are hiring them and they need them. So uh, what we're doing at the foundation is like, is to ensure that actually will power 75% of all organizations we work with to be Africans, local organizations, so that actually they are the one intubating, they're the one uh, giving the services to young people. And they have the, uh, the sole responsibility to develop Africa themselves, not, not any other organization come from abroad to develop Africa. So the intentionality has to start now. And uh, that's one beautiful thing I think I appreciate with the foundation. Even if you, even you come to all our offices in Africa, you will find that the offices have been Africanized. So, and we want even organization to work with to be Africa. That's why we see that that's the only way we can solve most of these problems by ourselves. And uh, I believe that's the point I had to make because without that, still, the resources will flow outside Africa. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's, so, it's so apt what you're saying, and I think it's something that we're, we're, everyone is saying in different ways. But also, I think um, one of the other things that we can do as well um, is that when we are sitting on these tables too, um, like you have mentioned, Yavi, uh, and, if she, if she's, and I think she said that even this morning, she said, if I sit on the table, or I'm on a panel, I'm the only woman, I'm asking them why. Um, we have to ask, why am I the only African person here? You just, you, we, have to, we just have to do it. And we have to ask, and you, you, immediately I can bring up my phone, I can nominate. I mean, even in board, you're coming to, you're saying that there's no woman, you can't find any woman in the whole country. It's not possible now. Just ask me, I can give you 10 strong women across Africa, and they'll be able to do that work for you. And so we have to always keep on pushing and pushing and pushing. And so that's why I like the way MasterCard works in terms of when you go anywhere, you see that it's our, the people. Doesn't mean that there's, there's no correlation with other countries. Doesn't mean that we don't need the international voice. We don't need, it's necessary. But we, as you said before, we all have to have a voice, not just one particular voice. And I think that's actually changing. During COVID, nobody came to save us. We saved ourselves. Yes. I mean, we all had to come up with solutions for ourselves. Vaccines we couldn't get. We had to find ourselves begging, calling. I was on the committee for car COVID in Nigeria. I'm a co-administrator till now. I was, we're always on the phone. We need this vaccination. Well, we, we, can't, we can't get it to you right now. Our people are going to die. But nobody, I mean, so those are the things. But we now have to also use our networks to understand that who are the best people to talk to. So all the things are necessary. Every one of us have to work together. It can't just be one particular tranche. So, yeah, Africa for Africa is good, but we also need this sector. We also need this sector. Local government is good, but we also need state. We also need, you know, so everything has to work. Private sector is good, but government is good. <laughs> NGOs, because the NGOs are necessary as well. So we all have to see how do we all come to the table. And when you are sitting at that table, you must call other people to join you. You must drag other people to join you. So your voice is, does not get, you know, nonsensical as, as Nigerians would call it. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, thank you. Uh, I'd like you to help me thank our panelists for their rich contributions and diverse perspectives. 
Um, so we have a few things to reflect on as we go out. So how do we get our voices heard, you know, by the governments? You know, how do we get to the African Union with all our thoughts? Um, you know, <laughs> how, do we, how do we have the right policies adopted for entrepreneurship to really be advanced in Africa? Um, the other thing is really how do we le really learn from each other? You know, the, the purpose of this uh, forum is to really connect, you know, as Africans from different regions. Um, how do we learn from each other? How do we, you know, iterate our businesses to really fit uh, our market? But also, how do we get young people um, to be to, to actually get the right role models? I think that's very important, and it came out really well. And how do we retain the youth? You know. So, but without further ado, <laughs> I will thank you, and then you know, just pass it over to the next. I think we took a bit more time um, than expected, but thank you so much for your great contributions. <laughs>